Well, good morning. Let's pray. Lord, we thank You for Your Word, for the work it does in our hearts, and we pray that Your Spirit would lead us this morning. Speak through me as we open Your Word, as we speak with Your authority. Uh, Lord, I pray that our hearts might be penetrated and that You might change our lives as a result of this text. We pray in Your Son's name. Amen. I remember anticipation as a kid, whether it was a birthday or Christmas, we lived in a rural area and, and there weren't street lights. It was a small road in front of our house. And I remember Christmas Eve in particular because my grandparents always brought a lot of gifts for Christmas Eve. We celebrated Christmas Eve every year with my grandparents. They would come over, we would open tons of gifts, uh, and it was a delight. But I remember every year in my youth sitting by our front door because for those of you who were raised in a rural area, you might relate, there would be headlights. You'd notice the dim movement of headlights and they would get brighter and brighter and then the car would keep going and you'd be disappointed. And I kept You know, I would sit there and anticipate and wait on my grandparents' car to to slow down. Because there was this, I can't describe it, there was this internal emotion that the second you saw that car slow down, you knew it was the grandparents and they were about to turn into the driveway with all their goodies. And I remember that, I remember that adrenaline. and, And the excitement wasn't my grandparents, because my grandparents came by quite frequently. It was these gifts that they were bringing to us. My anticipation was selfish. My anticipation as a kid was focused on me and what I would get. But those memories are singed in my mind. But here's the thing. None of those gifts, I I don't even remember. I doubt any of those gifts have any value today. But I remember the way they made me feel. Well, with the gospel... In our understanding of who Jesus is, we sit on the other side of that anticipation. If you remember through Advent season, we looked at the coming of Christ and, and what the Messiah meant, why He was coming. But, but we sit here in 2024 with an understanding of who Jesus was. That we sit on the other side of that anticipation. Jesus has already arrived. You and I know that Jesus is the Messiah. But do we live like it? Jesus, uh, in this text, we're going to see as Jesus confronts the Pharisees, we're going to see that Jesus is not merely the human Messiah of their expectations. But He's God. And He's worthy of of our worship and our awe. So if you have your Bible, go ahead and turn to Matthew chapter 22. We'll be looking at verses 41 to 46. As you probably remember, this is a continuation of Jesus' confrontation with the religious leaders. This is a continuation of Tuesday at the temple. After the triumphal entry and the cleansing of the temple, the Pharisees... They, remember, they ask him about the source of his authority. By whose authority do you do these things? He's warned them through parables about their rejection of him and the consequences of their rejection of him. They challenged him about whether or not they should pay taxes. And then last week, there was a challenge about the law and the nature of what he was bringing. In our text today, the tables are going to turn. Jesus is going to be the one that introduces the challenging question. And and the result will be sort of a checkmate for the religious leaders. He's going to once again elevate their understanding of who He is. So let's look at the text. It says, While the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them a question. Their questions have ended. So now Jesus is going to ask one of His own. He said, Why do you, what do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? And they said to him, he's the son of David. It's a bit of an obvious question. It's an academic question. Remember that word Christ 
is, is the, 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 the Greek rendering of the Old Testament word for Messiah or anointed one. And so the question is, what do you think about the Messiah? Whose son is he? Is he? Matthew's already made it clear. Of course, the crowd has presented Jesus as the son of David in the last chapter during the triumphal entry as he cleansed the temple. The blind men back in chapter 9 have identified Jesus as the son of David. After healing the demon-possessed man in chapter 12, the people ask, could this be the son of David? The Canaanite woman in chapter 15 whose daughter was possessed, remember the one that that said, even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table, she recognizes Jesus as the son of David. In chapter 20, he healed two more blind men, and they said, have mercy on us, son of David. It seems obvious what Jesus is doing. He's connecting the dots for them. Though he hasn't called himself the son of David, it's clear that the crowd believes that Jesus is the son of David. Jesus is the long-awaited son of David. And he's helping them see the full implication of that. When you say son of David, what is it exactly you're calling me? And that's what this exchange is going to be intended to, to highlight. Son of David, Messiah. This is, this is a term of significant theological implication. The expectation from the beginning was that, that Messiah would be David's son. Matthew set us up for this back in chapter 1, verse 1. Remember he said, The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Let's take a little excursion through the Old Testament to, to see how we got here. We go all the way back to Genesis chapter 3. Remember the fall, Adam and Eve partake the fruit. God confronts them in the garden. He had said that, that if you eat of this tree, you will surely die and they ate the fruit, and he comes in chapter 3. We have the curse. And beginning in verse 14 in chapter 3, the Lord said to the servant, Because you've done this, cursed are you above all livestock, above the beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and the dust you shall eat all the days of your life. And then he gives the first shadow of the gospel. In verse 15. Look at it. He says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. This is the first image we have just after the fall. Immediately after the fall when when God would have had every right to hit the reset button and to do away with Adam, Eve, the earth, He issues a promise through the serpent that there's an offspring of a woman who will ultimately deal with evil. Again, this is the first shadow we have of the gospel, that we have an offspring of Eve that will ultimately once and for all, deal with this sin. Now, the way the Bible works, we, you wouldn't know that just by reading this verse by itself, but what we see throughout the rest of Scripture is an unfolding of what that means. As we go just a few chapters later, the first 11 chapters of Genesis really establish the foundation of, of, of the rest of the Bible. The first 11 chapters set really the foundation, and we begin in chapter 12 of Genesis to move to the patriarchs, to, to, to the group of people that God is going to use, beginning with Abraham, to bring about this ultimate promise. To the Abrahamic covenant in chapter 12, it's, it's going to be later ratified officially in Genesis chapter 15. But, but if you're in your Bible, flip to Genesis chapter 12. I'm going to read, it says, The Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred, in your father's house to a land 
that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you, and I will make your name great, so that you'll be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and who dishonors you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. This is a significant point. One of the most significant points in your Old Testament is God makes this promise through Abraham. And the promise has three components. The first is the land, that you're going to go to this land that I will give you. But then he promises offspring. Remember, Abraham and Sarah are barren. They have no opportunity to have kids, and he's increasing in his age. But God says, I will make you a great nation. He promises offspring. But then it's a third part of this blessing that, that really applies to our text today. He says, in you all the nations of the earth will be blessed. We don't understand fully the implication of that until Messiah comes. But ultimately, you know, the, the, the image here of blessing is that, that Abram, I'm going to bless you. And through my blessing of you, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. There's, there's, a, there's a subtext of a, th- a theological development we have even of blessing, that the Lord blesses us that we might be a blessing to others. But in this specific case, He's blessing Abraham. Abraham is going to be the father of the nation of Israel. He's blessing him that all the nations of the earth will be blessed. That that's a future promise of a coming Messiah who will ultimately deal, not with material blessings, but with the complete eradication of sin. The promise will go through Abraham, as we read through the rest of Genesis, the promise will go through Abraham's son Isaac to Jacob, who will have 12 sons. And we learn in Genesis 49 that the Messianic line goes through Judah. Look at Genesis 49.10. Jacob's giving a blessing to Judah. He says, the, she- the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until tribute comes to him, and to him shall be the obedience of the peoples. It's a promise of an everlasting scepter that will come through Judah. Again, it's a shadow looking forward to the Messiah. A lot of times when people imagine the New Testament, they, they can imagine it disconnected from the Old Testament. Or they imagine that, that God tried this certain plan in the Old Testament, it didn't work, so we went to this new plan in the New Testament. But as we read through Genesis, as we go from, from, from the first gospel to the Abrahamic covenant to this promise to Judah, we start to see that this is actually the unfolding of God's plan all along. It's like a theater curtain that begins to open. And we see what was behind the stage. It's it's a progressive revealing of God's plan to save you and me from our sin. But He doesn't stop there. Uh, As as we move forward about a thousand years to 2 Samuel chapter 7 to the Davidic covenant. This is the promise that God is making to David near the end of his life not near the end of his life, at the beginning of his reign, he comes to him and he makes this promise. And pay attention at the end. The, 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 the big part of this promise is going to be made um, specifically talking about David's direct offspring fulfilled in Solomon. But as we get to the end of this prophecy, look at the, the, the expansive language that he uses. He says, when your, day, when your days are fulfilled, will you lie down with your fathers... I will raise up your offspring after you who shall come from your body. I will establish his kingdom. He will build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be to him a father. He shall be to me a son. When he commits iniquity, I will discipline him with the rod of men, with the stripes of the sons of men. But my steadfast love will not depart from him as I took it from Saul, whom I put away before you. And your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. 
There's a clear expectation among the Jewish people that the Messiah will sit on Judah's throne, that he will be a descendant of David, that he will be David's son, fulfilling this very prophecy. This is why back in Matthew 1, we trace the lineage to Jesus that it goes from Abraham to Isaac to Jacob to Judah to David to Jesus. That Matthew wants you and I to understand that this was God's plan all along. This is His intention to bring glory to His name to save us through one who will come, through the Messiah, through the Anointed One. Go back to Matthew 22. There's more. He said to them, How is it that David in the Spirit calls him Lord, saying, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. Notice he said, David in the Spirit. We don't want, Jesus doesn't want to leave any vagary here. Psalm 110 is David's words. And a lot of folks up to this point had just interpreted it simply as a messianic psalm looking forward to this Messiah who would come and set up an earthly kingdom. Jesus wants you and I and and all that were in the audience that day to understand when he said this is why David spoke in the Spirit. This is the Word of God. What David said wasn't an accident. What David said is exactly what God wanted David to say. And you can take this as the Word of God. This wasn't a foible. It wasn't an editorial mistake. When David says, the Lord said to my Lord, that wasn't an accident. That was in the Spirit. These words are authoritative. Psalm 110 is the most quoted psalm in our New Testament. It's quoted over 25 times. Looking forward to the Messiah. He says, sit at my right hand. The Lord will have victory over His enemies and will exalt it and and exalted to sit at Yahweh's right hand. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand. Whoever it is that David's talking about isn't just going to be a religious leader. You and I won't sit at the Lord's right hand. But whoever David is talking about in this psalm will sit at God's right hand. They will share in his authority. And then Jesus asked the question, If then David calls him Lord, how is he his son? This is a great question. The religious leaders to this point have been asking questions to trap Jesus. Questions about taxes. They've been asking hypothetical questions about the resurrection. They're asking gotcha questions about the law. Jesus' question though is, is very important. It's going to get to the heart of the most important thing. Who is the Messiah? And what is His nature? David calls Him Lord. This is unheard of. Imagine ancestors claiming higher rank, looking to their children as a higher rank. No patriarch or king would call his son my Lord. It's not natural. If, if you and I were walking down the street and we, and we saw a father referring to his son in deferential terms, if he was, even if it was something as, as simple as yes sir, inside that feels odd to us. We would assume there's more to the story. Maybe, maybe his son is his boss. Maybe his son is an elected official. Maybe his son's the president. But, but it's odd to have an older father say to his younger son, my Lord. Could it be that David in the Spirit is speaking, is speaking about more than just a human son? Could it be maybe that this prophetic psalm, Psalm 110, is speaking about more than just an earthly king 
a nationalistic leader. This highlights the misunderstanding. The Jews expected a merely human Messiah, a liberator, a nationalist that would deliver them from the oppression that they faced. But Jesus says, why would David call a human king Lord? Think about that. You and I can answer that question, right? We know the whole picture. If we were sitting in the classroom, this is, this is like when Jesus asks the Pharisees this question, why would David call him Lord? We're, it's kind of like when you're sitting in a classroom and the teacher calls on somebody that doesn't know the answer and you're sitting on your hands because you know it. Why would David call him Lord? Because he's God. Because he's Messiah. Because he's Jesus. By now in the book of Matthew, the readers of the book of Matthew, we get it. We've seen the baptism and the transfiguration where God says, this is my beloved Son. We've heard Peter's confession back in Matthew 16. You are Christ. You are Messiah. The Son of the living God. We get it. We understand Jesus is the Messiah. The Messiah is more than just an earthly leader. The Messiah is God. The Messiah will rule. The Messiah will reign at God's right hand. Matthew's made it incredibly clear to us. Jesus has made it incredibly clear. And at this point, the Pharisees should have hit their knees. Everybody in the crowd should have hit their knees. But they didn't. He says, and no one was able to answer him a word. Nor did from that day did anyone dare ask him any more questions. Checkmate. They're out of questions. In the back of their mind, they knew what Jesus is claiming. There's no way they didn't. Later in the text, before the Sanhedrin, apparently the Pharisees had taken word of the Sanhedrin. This guy's claiming to be Messiah. Because the Sanhedrin, that's what they tell Jesus. Are, are you claiming to be the Messiah? So they know what he's implying here. They just won't admit it publicly because it 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 contrasts with their expectation they want the messiah to do what they want the messiah to do jesus demands far more than that they want messiah for their own purposes jesus says uh uh-uh. uh the messiah is god the messiah sits at god's right hand the Net Bible has a note. It says they couldn't solve the dilemma because they didn't expect the Lord, lowercase, to be the Lord, uppercase. They couldn't solve this problem because they had no category in their mind that allowed them to say, my little L Lord is actually God. They just, it, it just warped their mind and they couldn't go there. And so they're unwilling to say that Jesus is deity. They couldn't imagine a world where the Son of Man, this expected Son of Man that they had been looking for, they couldn't imagine a world where He would actually be elevated to the right hand of God and enthroned beside Yahweh. For them, that was heresy. You're saying the Messiah will be enthroned beside Yahweh. That's impossible. That's wrong. But if that's your stance, then you got a problem. Because David said in Psalm 110, The Lord said to my Lord, this is David talking, David is bowing his knee to this descendant. So how do you explain that? You can't. They completely back down with a toe-to-toe. And what's interesting is Jesus doesn't explicitly answer the question. But the inference is clear. 
Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of David according to the flesh, but the Son of God according to power. That's what Paul says in Romans chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. He says, concerning the Son who is descended from David according to the flesh and was declared to be the Son of God in power according to the Spirit of holiness by His resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. Jesus isn't merely a descendant of David. He is David's Lord with all authority. He is both man and God. That's what their minds couldn't get wrapped around. Because they, didn't have, they were blinded by their own expectation. They were blinded by their own anticipation. And this completes his silencing of the religious leaders. But why is this text here? Why do you and I, how do we interact with this text? Jesus is teaching us through this question. He wants the crowd to see that when they call Him the Son of David, there's a lot more that goes with that. It's, it's a lot more loaded than they realize. Jesus is God. He's the long-expected seed of Eve who will defeat the serpent. He's the descendant of Abram who will bless the nations. He's the descendant of Judah who will hold the scepter. And He's the son of David whose throne is established forever. Jesus is the capital M Messiah. Both God and and man. You know, we have over 300 prophecies from the Old Testament that are fulfilled in the life of Jesus. Some go as high as to say 450, but, but the general consensus is there are at least 300 prophecies that Jesus fulfills. In the Psalms alone, we see prophecies about His passion. You know, Psalm 22 why have you forsaken me is going to match Jesus' words on the cross in Matthew 27. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? We've got psalms that talk about his passion, uh, his fervor. There are psalms that talk about the, uh, the, un, the unusual authority of his teaching. We have psalms that prophesy about his glory. But then we expand... To the rest of the Old Testament, we've got prophecies that, that tell us where he will be born. We have prophecies that predict the virgin birth. We have a prophecy that, prophecies that deal with his death, even to the point that, that, that even though in crucifixion, you get late in the day, you break the legs, so the person finally dies, but Jesus had already died, and, and he, we find out specifically that his bones were not broken to fulfill an Old Testament prophecy that his bones wouldn't be broken. We have prophecies about His resurrection. We have prophecies about His ascension. And these prophecies encourage us. Again, it's, it's not that, that God called a cosmic audible and because the law didn't work, He sent Christ. Or that God's intention was for Adam and Eve never to sin and, and He had to have a backup plan. This was God's intention from the beginning. To bring glory to His name and to save us. They encourage us and comfort us the fulfilling of this prophet. We receive comfort because it shows us our faith is reasonable. There's an apologetic angle to prophecy that brings us a comfort to say, you know, this isn't just a made up religion. Things that were prophesied thousands of years before were actually fulfilled. That, that, that the fulfillment of prophecy is a, is a significant component of apologetics as we're defending the reasonableness of the Christian faith. The odds that one person would fulfill all these prophecies is absurd. It's impossible. So prophecy alone is a significant leg for a defense of our faith. But it's not just that. That we are meant to look at this text and to respond to this text with praise. 
these prophecies aren't simply to encourage our faith, that they demonstrate that God's eternal plan is being carried out. That our anticipation, that the anticipation of the world was not for naught. If you thought my grandparents showed up with great gifts that I don't even remember, how much greater was the fulfillment of the anticipation of the long-awaited Messiah. He exceeded any expectation that the Jews may have had. Jesus is Lord. In Genesis 3, we get the promise of a deliverer. In Romans 3, we learn that the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus by all who believe. That Jesus enables Paul to say it is by grace through faith that you are righteous. We move from the Old Testament shadow, the law that meant to point to Christ, that meant to point to our unworthiness, that meant to point to our sin, that meant to point to the fact that blood had to cover our sin, that death was the result of sin. The shadow of of sacrifice that would be fulfilled in the full-on image of Jesus Christ. The shadow of the Messiah that, that begins in Genesis 3 and expands slowly till we get a full image. It's like the old Polaroid, or the new Polaroids, I guess. You know, you take the picture, it's a white screen, but as you watch it over a couple of minutes, it comes in to focus. So that as we look through the Old Testament, it's, it's this slow developing so that as Jesus stands before these Pharisees, you have this mystery text in Psalm 110. What in the world could David mean? The Lord said to my Lord, well, here I am. The Messiah, the God-man, that we go from death to life. That we see messianic expectation of fulfillment is the ark of the whole Bible. Jesus is in, in Jesus over you know here at the end of Matthew. Our next as we go through the rest of this text this summer, we're going to see this completing arc of a fulfillment of a promise that goes all the way back to the beginning. This is the story of the Bible. Our faith is not theoretical. It's not just an ethereal set of ideas, concepts of be good. It's the fulfillment of God's promise. So our response should be awe. It should be wow. It should be praise. This is Jesus' last address to the religious leaders that he's going to begin starting next week to deal, to talk to the crowds. He's going he's to give woes to the Pharisees for all the signs they missed. But he's going to be talking for the benefit of the crowd. So here's the thing. We're, we're in a church service. Most of you guys have placed your faith in Jesus. So it's not that you and I are denying that Christ is the Messiah. It's not that we, like the Pharisees, would deny Jesus' deity. It's that we ignore Him in our lives. It's that this idea has become so commonplace to us. Yeah, 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 Jesus is the Messiah. Let's go. Move on to the next text. It's that we treat Him casually. That Jesus is our friend, but he's not merely our friend. That we reduce him to buddy. The Nicene Creed, Jesus is God. God from God, light from light, very God of very God, of the same essence as the Father. Jesus is God. Tim Challies put it, I shared this last year with our ministry directors, but he put out a, he had a, a write-up and he, and he was talking about how we lose the wonder of certain things in the Bible. How we lose the wonder of Messiah. How, how we yawn at times at the gospel. And he said, there was a time in human history where man worshipped the moon. They saw the moon above them and considered it an awesome manifestation of the divine. So they worshipped it. 
paying, paying homage to it as God. But as civilization advanced, men constructed instruments through which they could study the moon. They came to realize that it was merely a moon orbiting the earth. They saw that it was a giant dirt ball that had no light of its own, for it only reflected the light of the sun. In the name of science, men were sent to the moon and walked on its surface. Like so many others, I've stood in line at the Smithsonian Museum in Washington to touch a piece of the moon, worn smooth under pressure of millions of fingers. At this point, we can say that the moon has been thoroughly demystified. We know what it is. We know what it's made of. And we even know its importance to the earth. When we gaze at the moon today, we do so with so little of the awe and wonder of men thousands of years ago. And obviously his point isn't that we need to return to the worship of the moon. But it's that how familiarity sometimes can lead us to, to, to missing the awe and the wonder. May we never treat Jesus this way. May we never treat Jesus, the son of David, Jesus, the son of God, casually, with no awe, that he, that he would always receive our worship, our praise, our gratitude, our time, our hearts, our obedience, and our awe. Let's pray. Father, we are so thankful for your eternal plan. You didn't leave us with merely death as a result of our sin. But that you sent your Son. And Jesus, we praise you for all that you have done and all that you are. That you are the God-man. That you are able to live a holy, perfect life, to die in our place as a man. But as God, that that death was effective to save any of us who would place our faith in you. And so, Lord, we are thankful. I pray that you would protect our hearts from casualness, that you would protect our hearts uh, from from seeing you and what you've done for us as ordinary. And that, Lord, our hearts might be captivated, that we might live in awe. And when our hearts grow cold, that we might repent and that your spirit might enable us to see you for who you are.